Inevitably, the people who are going to get caught in the middle of this or will be called upon by the public to sort it out are the New Zealand Police and the organisation that represents, by way of, I guess you'd call it a union, our police force is the Police Association. Their head, Chris Cahill, uh, joins us on the line now. Uh, Chris, welcome to the programme. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Sean. All right. Look, firstly, I want to get this in perspective. Is the spate of, of drive-by shootings, and thankfully no injuries or fatalities in and around Auckland, is this an unusual spike? Is it a serious trend or is it a, a little flare-up? Oh, this is certainly an unusual spike. This is two groups who have got out of control and their tit-for-tat behaviour is, is something that we haven't witnessed before. But in saying that, we still get a lot of firearm incidents, especially amongst gangs, in a regular period anyway. But, but this is certainly above and beyond that. What sort of weapons, uh, I can't tell by looking at the TV pictures and reading the reports, what sort of weapons? Are they using weapons that might otherwise be banned or is it the twenty two rifle or a sawn-off shotgun or what? Yeah, it's a mixture I'm getting reports from. Mostly uh, what we call long barrel firearms, so rifles, some shotguns. Um, not clear whether there's pistols being used or, or handguns being used. Um, sometimes there's been quite a spate of um, converting starter pistols into um, firearms that can be used, so they have a lot of those out there. But in general, we're not hearing that these are the semi-automatic assault rifles that have been banned. We know there's still some of those out there, but that doesn't appear to be what's the most um, common mm. weapon being but used. But we can the, assume, Chris, the, that these people aren't members of the local gov uh, gun club and these none of these firearms are registered. Uh, dead right. These, these weapons will have been obtained in, in two key ways. One is stolen from licensed firearms owners, or what actually is increasingly coming to light now that police are spending more time investigating where the firearms come from, is what's called straw buying, which is legitimate firearms owners, well, they're not, they're, they've got licences, but they're unscrupulous and they buy them legitimately, then on sell them to gang members. And that is a major problem um, that we're now seeing right across New Zealand. So we have gun dealers who are selling the gang's guns. No, no, the gun dealers are selling them to licensed firearms owners. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, and, and then, but because we have no gun registry, a licensed firearms owner who's unscrupulous can buy as many firearms as they like. There's no record of how many they've bought and there's no record of what they then do with them. So they can easily on-sell them to these gang members and that's what they're doing for a profit. Um, so, and you know, sometimes the gang members are getting into them for drug debts and then making them do this. Other times it's simply pure greed. And, and that's what our police investigations are, are turning up regularly now. Can anything be done about that that isn't being done right now? No, look, unfortunately the genie got out of the bottle when we, do, when we failed to uh, have a gun register. We're now working through that and the are gun register up and operating next year. Uh, it's, it's taken longer than I would have liked, but we do have to get it right. Um, you know, this government's committed to that. We want to hear National make commitments to that as well. It's the biggest game changer in the medium to long term. But in the, the immediate term, it's the guns are already out there. So we've got to get in front of those gangs. We've got to do the search warrants. We've got to stop them and search them and get the guns off them. All right. I, would there be any concern that this outbreak or these heightened tensions, this war, let's call it a war, between the tribesmen and the killer bees could spread, that they affiliate with other gangs and you get a wider conflict? It's a, I'd say that's our biggest concern. Uh, at this stage, it seems to be contained to these two groups and it's been going on for a few months and now escalated. But, you know, we know we have a, a lot of gang members out there. There's a big increase in numbers, and there's more gangs than we've ever had and more factions. So that's uh, the biggest concern, um, that it, it just overreaches. And it could be something as simple as the wrong house getting shot up, another gang member becoming involved. And, look, it's got to be terrifying for these communities. Some of these houses have nothing to do with gang members. They've got the wrong address. These communities must be living in fear, and, and something's got to be done around this group.
Yeah, when you say an increase in gang numbers, is this fueled by the 501s coming back? It seems to have really ignited the fire. It, it's really unusual that New Zealand's got the lowest unemployment rate for as many years as anyone can remember. Yet our gang membership's going through the roof. Normally, you'd think it's the other way around. But so clearly, somewhere along the line, there's a disconnect between what's happening in some parts of New Zealand and what's happening with young people that are disaffected. Um, we've got to look at why so many are choosing to join the gangs in the first place. Okay. When you say an increase, what could we, do we have a, a rough guesstimate of how many people in New Zealand are gang members, criminal gang members? Yeah, well, look, we're talking numbers in, in the three to 5,000 sort of range, and I know that's a pretty wide sort of... But you do have to be careful um, to make, you know, when you're, when you're picking gang uh, numbers, we c you really need to know people have got a patch on their back and be able to prove it rather than just say they're an associate um, if you want to get those numbers right. But it certainly uh, has grown exponentially in the last five years and it's grown since those 501s have come back and taken a more violent approach. The more local gangs have decided they need to bolster their numbers. Mm. Well, at the end of the day, as I said, most middle-class New Zealanders aren't actually, in real terms, going to likely to confront the problems that this causes in their everyday lives. But one set of people who do are your members, are police officers, who get told to do something about it and get caught in the crossfire and I think at the end of the day have to mop up the pieces when everything goes horribly wrong. Do you think your members have the support they need uh, from their employer, from the government, to deal with these issues, um, and how do they keep themselves safe in a situation like this? It's certainly very scary times for our members. I mean, the idea of going to work and, and the chances are you're going to deal with an armed offender used to be a, quite a rare event. Now it's something that officers are expecting almost on a daily basis, and that's they're choosing to wear their... Um, the ballistic plates in their body armour, so their bulletproof plates, on a daily basis, which was what they were never designed to. They were designed to put in for you know, inc one-off incidents. So they're doing that because of the risk. But, look, police have done a good job. The government's backed that up with some money to increase the training for officers. We've got a frontline safety uh, um, enhancement skills course, which gives officers better training on how to deal with issues, how to respond, to come up with better tactical options. We um, Obviously, there's still the issue of access to firearms. And, well, come uh, on, we in real terms, Glock in the glove box, Bushmaster in the boot, isn't it? Yep, that's the real terms. And look, that's better than many countries. But the problem is when you're confronted with someone, when you stop a vehicle and you don't know who's in it, that gun not being on your hip is a problem. And look, we're, we're advocating uh, the idea of arming down rather than arming up. So that is when you're out on patrol and you don't know what you're dealing with, you've got a gun on your hip. If you're getting out of the car to go to uh, walk through a shopping mall, things like that, take the gun off, put it in the glove box, you don't need it, or in the lock box, you don't need it. Um, those sorts of things, and especially at the moment in Auckland when you've got so many offenders with guns that are clearly willing to use them. Uh, we want to make sure proper risk assessments are done so those officers have the right equipment. Uh, look, uh, and I don't think any New Zealander would begrudge frontline police those options. Um, and it's, uh, look, I'm really interested in what you say today, Chris, because you're introdu introducing a nuance that I think a lot of people uh, miss. And I've got to say, in a personal sense, I go to Australia and I see a copper walking down a street in Sydney with a firearm and it changes my feeling about the place I'm in and I'm at and it doesn't make me comfortable. And I think that's... I wouldn't like to see that every day in New Zealand, but then I talk to you and you're doing a, I don't know, a traffic stop in Otara um, and there's been 14 shooters, shootings in the last five days and I'm a police officer, I want to have some serious deterrent or, or at least feel, feel a little bit safer than I might otherwise. Is there anything operationally or procedurally now that stops a police officer putting the gun on their hip for a traffic stop? Well, they've got to have done a risk assessment that, that says to them that there's a definite known threat before they can just wear a firearm at will. And look, that's, oh, I think that's appropriate, that police have to be able to justify what they're doing. Um, 
But at the moment, I think that threat's there all the time, given the number of firearms incidents we're having. And, and look, it's also important, the last thing we would ever want was a member of the public shot by a gang member while police are scrambling around to get a firearm out of the boot of their car. So I think it's a matter of getting that mix right. And, and you're right, the majority of New Zealanders probably don't want um, to see officers fully armed every single day. But that arming down, I think, is the way to go. So you won't see officers wandering around shopping malls and things like that with firearms on their hip if there's no risk. But, they, but the public will still know officers have that access for the incidents that we're now seeing across Auckland. Chris, I want to go a bit wider, um, and I know uh, these are issues, I mean, they're the bread and butter of what you do for a job. You look across to the United States, that shooting in Texas, it sounds like the same story over and over uh, again there. What is your firstly emotional reaction when you read stories like that, and the fact that actually an enforcement officer had to take that person's life with a firearm in the end? Yeah, it's... It's just so hard to comprehend how America can continue to uh, fail to do gun reform when these young kids are killed so readily. I mean, we hear these big ones, but there's been something like 200-odd already this year shootings around schools. I mean, it's incredible um, what goes on over there, and it's just such a disappointment to look at it. And and that's I, I have to take my hat off to the government. It might have been a bit slow, but the reality is they've made changes since the Christchurch massacre. And those changes are long-term changes. You're not going to see an immediacy in those results, but you're going to see it long-term. So, you know, a gun registry will mean in 20 years' time we're not saying, why didn't we act? And that's what we did in in Christchurch in 2019. We said, why didn't we act after Justin Thorpe told us what to do after the Arab Moana massacre? We shouldn't have to have that conversation again in New Zealand, which is a real positive. And I certainly say to all other political parties, you need to back that gun register. It's the biggest change that will make the biggest difference that we won't be talking about some of these horrible things we see in America in the future. What do you think it is that that stops the Americans from doing anything, from doing the right thing, actually? I think you just see such a split um, culture and, and community in America. I mean, their elections are divided, you know, so much um, down um, party political lines with no common sense um, coming into the fray. I mean, we don't want to be a country where it's all the political decides what's right for the community rather than actually doing the right thing. Politicians shouldn't be making decisions certainly on how many votes they can get. They should be making them on what's actually right for the community. And if that means sometimes you've got to agree with the opposition or agree with the government, then that's the right thing to actually do. I mean, look at look at the Supreme Court and their reported, you know, position around abortion. No matter what you're your view of abortion is. I think the idea that you can turn out over some law that's been in a country for that many years and we're having that discussion in 2022 just tells you that America's got some fundamental problems. Mm. And Chris, your advice to frontline police officers in Auckland as this tension between the tribesmen and the killer bees continues, what, what's the best they can do to keep themselves as safe as possible? Well, I think that the best is, is think about their training, consider their, their safety every every time they're going to a job, you know, get together with your colleagues and have a plan of action around what you're going to do if particular incidents happen. Um, if you're uncomfortable about the equipment or or the amount of staff you've got, speak up, don't be scared. Police will not you know, have an issue with you raising um, concerns you have. You're the people on the front line that know what the risk is, so let people know so you can get the support you need. And also just remember, and I think it's really important, your family is worrying about you when you go to work. Just spend a little bit more time sending the text messages while you're at work, letting your loved ones know you're actually safe because they worry about you as well. Chris, I thank you very much indeed for your time this morning and what was a very, very interesting discussion about important issues in our society. Thanks a lot.